really is the difference between liberalism and anti-fascism? Well, that's not so clear, is it? So I hope this debate will bring some clarity to this disagreement. Thanks so much. <clears throat> we will now kick it over, as I had mentioned, to Brenton for his five-minute opening statement as well. Brenton, the floor is all yours. Thanks for being here as well. Topic today is nationalism versus anti-fascism. And though our opponents are not simply nationalists, in a way it is very fitting that it is Caleb and I who are forming an ideological anti-fascist front. Because historically speaking, the first people to recognize fascism for what it is and the first line of defense against it are socialists, of both the Marxist and libertarian varieties. The argument we are currently having is an old one, at least as old as the modern world. And in 2020, we have the benefit of history on our side and can look back at these movements and see exactly where they will invariably lead. Mm -hmm. This is why Stryker and Enoch will tell you that they are nationalists. And in a certain totally wrong and incredibly deceptive sense, they are at least a little bit correct. Because nationalism, at its core, is poison. Like a poison, it ravaged Europe and Asia, not once, but twice, in less than a century. Nationalism brought about the greatest crime in all of human civilization, the single most horrifying blunder of any culture in all 250,000 years that our species have been on this planet. And when the wars were over, and the trials were concluded, and the guilty punished, nationalism nearly brought about the end of all life on Earth as we know it in a single nuclear holocaust. And to tell you the truth, it still might. That's still on the table. And yet, my esteemed interlocutors will tell you that they're nationalists. And to many, this will seem a perfectly reasonable and respectable label. Why? Well, because as any good chemist knows, the poison is in the dose. And that right there is their game. How, sir, can you speak such terrible slander of arsenic? Don't you know that arsenic saves lives? It treats leukemia. What do you have against cancer patients, you monster? Now, please, sit there and have the tea that I have lovingly prepared for you. Why aren't you drinking it? Do you love cancer? Now that's ridiculous. But for the most part, that ridiculous statement is pretty much going to be every argument you're going to hear from them today. Because fascism or third positionism or identitarianism or whatever other idiotic rebrand they come up with in the next week once they realize people have caught on to their grift are all more or less the same. This is because fascism is not a political ideology in the sense of anarchism, liberalism, Marxism, or feudalism. Fascism is a cluster of mostly incoherent beliefs based largely on action over thought, emotion over reason, with superficial appearance, obsessed with superficial appearances while lacking any substantial philosophical or ideological core. It is the appearance of strength and power, but it is not the thing itself. And it taps into the basest parts of our animal brains and leads its adherents down an incredibly dark and self-destructive road. As we debate, I would like everyone to remember the immortal words of Jean-Paul Sartre. Never believe that anti-Semites are completely unaware of the absurdity of their replies. They know that their remarks are frivolous, open to challenge, but they are amusing themselves for this is, uh, for it is their adversary who is obliged to use words responsibly since he believes in words. The anti-Semites have the right to play. They even like to play with discourse, for, by giving ridiculous reasons, they discredit the seriousness of their interlocutors. They delight in acting in bad faith, since they do not seek to persuade by sound argument, but to intimidate and disconcert. If you press them too closely, they will abruptly fall silent, loftily indicating by some phrase that the time for argument is past. Now, hopefully, Enoch and Stryker will not fall into this pattern. After all, the only universal constant is change, and the past is the past. But still, some may wonder why I'm even bothering to have this conversation, given all of this, while others may ask what I offer besides criticism. And to them, I'm going to provide one final quote, this one from Daisaku Ikeda. It is the function of evil to divide to alienate people from each other and to turn one country against the next. The universe, this world, and our lives are a stage for a ceaseless struggle between hatred and compassion, between the destructive and constructive aspects of life. This is the evil over which we all must triumph. I believe that dialogue holds the key to any lasting solution. Words spoken from the heart have the power to change a person's life. They can even melt the icy walls of mistrust that separate peoples and nations. I am utterly convinced that we were not born into this world to hate and destroy each other. We must strive to make a profound reverence for life and human dignity, the prevailing spirit of our times, for ourselves, for our children, and for our planet. The real struggle of the 21st century will not be between civilizations nor religions. It will be between barbarity and civilization in the truest sense of the word. 
sometimes you have to look the devil in the eye. And that's what I'm here today to do. Thank you very much. We will now kick it over to Mike for his five minute opening statement as well. And I, as I mentioned, it's a flexible opening statement. So the speakers can use whatever they would like from that five minutes. So Mike, floor is all yours. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I, as we said, I, we are here representing the nationalist or third positionist position. My argument is that one, uh, white people, particularly in America and Europe, we have a right to collective self-organizing on our own behalf. This is a right that has been denied to us effectively by the Civil Rights Act, which is something we have talked about in the past. The Civil Rights Act uh, created a spoil system that is where rights and privileges are divvied out on the basis of racial membership. This is something that white, this is a game white people are not allowed to play. White people are the majority in the United States. You would think in a democracy, politicians would appeal to a majority, that they would make appeals based on that majority, yet they don't. And not only that, any politician that is even caught, the, the, the idea of, oh, is being caught. Are you, have you been caught accidentally appealing to white? Is your, is your program that you're suggesting going to benefit white people in any way? This is enough to discredit the politician and make them come crawling to the media, who is owned by our good friends. Uh, we know who they are. They will become calling to them for forgiveness simply for accidentally maybe saying something that might benefit white people. And so this is an intolerable situation for whites. Why should we? Why must we endure this? Is there some moral reason, some moral or political reasons why we should deprive ourselves of this right of collective self-organizing? It doesn't make any sense, particularly when the very people that will tell you this, that we have some special thing wrong with us, where every time we've done it in the past, it's led to some sort of horrible atrocity. This is the argument. There's no actual argument so, similar to uh, what, what is labeled fascism, national socialism. You can call me those words. I'm not going to run from it. But the thing is, what is the argument? There's no argument against, uh, against the political program. There's no argument against the politics. The argument is overblown atrocity propaganda that was concocted by both the United States and the Soviet Union, which have committed atrocities of their own and have no moral standing on which to accuse others of atrocities. So, you know, the, the post-war atrocity propaganda that was used to attack the National Socialist regime, one, it's paper thin. It can be, it can be, it can be argued against. And you, can, you can see right through it if you actually apply some reason to some of these claims. Secondly, both of these regimes committed their own atrocities. So they have no moral ground on which to judge another country. I mean, when you hear the United States going out there and talking about the next Hitler, every time the United States government argues for war, what is it? The next Hitler, the next Hitler, the next Hitler. If we can see through these lies today, we'll go back and look through the lies that you got 75 years ago. There, this, is Vic, this is nothing but Victor's justice and Victor's history. And everybody believes it, including our friends that we're going to debate here. They believe it. And there's no political argument. What is the political argument against an economy and a society based on promoting the health and well-being of a nation, a group of people together, uh, you know, as one. And it doesn't mean hatred of others. It doesn't have to mean hatred of others. There's nothing that implies that. The, the idea that this is about war. I mean, who, if they support communism or capitalism, is standing on any ground with which to say the other person supports their ideology inevitably leads to war or, or atrocities or genocides. I mean, that's an absurd thing. We know about the, the problems that have happened with uh, we know about issues that have happened with the Soviet Union. I'm not even going to necessarily go overboard with that because I believe some of that stuff might be lies as well. But we know about the atrocities committed by the United States. We know about atrocities committed by the Soviet Union. So, again, who stands in judgment? Who stands in judgment against nationalism, against national socialism, fascism, whatever you might want to call it, collective self-organization of European peoples? It's if your ideology allows for collective racial self-organization of other races, but not whites, then it's fundamentally unfair. And again, having a group of people organized on their own behalf as a nation does not imply uh, hatred or genocide of any other group. And uh, one wouldn't the idea that it necessarily leads to that is simply a lie they tell you to get you to run away from the idea of organizing on your own behalf. And that's all that we hear. Uh, whenever white people raise their heads and try to be politically active in their own behalf. So there we go. You bet. Thanks so much, Mike. We will now switch it over for the final opening statement. This will be from Caleb. Caleb, thanks for being here. The floor is all yours. Well, I thought I actually, for my opening statement, might begin by reading from the book of Matthew. Um, 
This is from the, the King James Bible. It says, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye that shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, of figs, of thistles? Every so good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by the fruits ye shall know them. And I think that that's a pretty good introduction to the position that I take, which is that everywhere we have seen the ideas advocated by our opponents here put into practice, we have seen nothing but destruction as a result. Argue what you want about Hitler's intentions, but no one would say that the, world, the Second World War turned out well for Germany. No one would say that the Second World War turned out well for Italy. And no one would say that the South, the US South, is the most prosperous and happy part of the United States. If racial segregation, racial division, separatism was the answer, the US South would be an economic paradise. But it's clearly not that, right? If you look at the US South, the place where slavery had its homeland, the place that had Jim Crow segregation, white workers, compared to black workers uh, may have lived a little bit better, but compared to white workers throughout the rest of the country, they were suffering, right? That racism hurts all workers. At no point uh, can you point to racial segregation and division as being to the benefit of working people. Uh, it is something used by the bosses to divide us. However, you know, there's all this talk about the good old days. People talk about Pittsburgh and Detroit and Cleveland and the once industrial centers of the United States where people worked in factories and had very good wages. Well, why was it that, that those workers had such good wages? It was because the Communist Party built the CIO, a interracial anti-fascist union. And with the slogan, black and white unite and fight, the major industries of the United States were unionized. And it was that, it was that struggle, that anti-racist struggle, anti-fascist struggle, that resulted in this standard of living people are now missing. People call it the American dream, but it was largely built by communists organizing on the basis of anti-racism. At the Flint sit-down strike, the 1937 event that people call the Gettysburg of the labor movement, uh, communists organized the workers to seize their factory and demand that those who made automobiles be paid a decent wage. And when they marched out of the plant victorious, they made a point of having the only African-American worker in the plant be the one to carry the American flag to show that racism was something that they opposed. Meanwhile, it was fascists in the Black Legion, followers of Father Coughlin, who didn't support the striking workers inside the plant, but mobilized to attack them and joined with the police to attack them. Fascists like to tell you that they are anti-capitalist, but if you scratch the surface, you can see that they're always getting support from Henry Ford. They're always getting support from big bankers. They're always being armed and supported by the most wealthy because in, in essence, fascism is nothing but an attempt to preserve capitalism. Those of us who understand Marxism and scientific socialism and dialectical materialism understand that when capitalist enter, capitalism enters a crisis, when the rate of profit is falling, when workers are being eliminated from the assembly line, uh, when this takes place, there is a big crisis. Products can't be sold. Wages start going down. There's instability in society. So one section of the ruling class will attempt to seize control of the government and utilize the government uh, to carry out mass destruction and political repression in the hopes of holding off the crisis. That's called bonapartism. It is an attempt to resolve the crisis with mass political repression and save the system. And when that happens, when there are divisions among the ruling class, uh, you'll see the socialist and workers movement join arm in arm and build a united front to try and beat it back. Fascism is nothing but an attempt to save capitalism. It is an attempt to preserve medieval hierarchies and it is based on the premise that some people are naturally superior to others, that some races, some nationalities are superior, and that the benefit uh, for all humanity comes from one section of humanity beating down, repressing, and grinding another section of humanity into poverty. 
Well, I would argue the opposite. I think China is a great example. The reason that China is now the second largest economy in the world is because they kicked out international capitalism by forming an anti-fascist united front. When Mao built the People's Liberation Army that fought off the Japanese invaders, that was not a racist army. That army not only had Han Chinese in it, it had Tibetans, that arm, army had Uyghurs, that army had Mongolians, that army had Koreans. They joined arm in arm, they got support from the Soviet Union, they got support from other countries, and they beat back the genocidal fascist invaders. And it began the process that has now made China the second largest economy in the world. Uh, there, China is, has gone from being one of the poorest countries on earth to being a global superpower by joining arm in arm, by embracing anti-fascism, by organizing the economy rationally to serve public good and rejecting this notion that some people should be exalted over others while other people get ground into the dirt. Uh, this notion that, that the way to get salvation for the white working class is by further beating down other people, by engaging in mass incarceration, by uh, escalating the repression of immigrants, uh, by strengthening the police state and allowing further political repression. This is a lie. I believe the hope for all humanity comes by lifting people up, not tearing people down, not trying to restore the past, not glorifying medieval hierarchies, slavery and primitivism and barbarism. I believe that we should look to the future and not the past. That's my opening statement. Thank you very much. We will now kick into open discussion. So thanks, gentlemen, and the floor is all yours. Okay, quickly, um, just two points I'm going to make real quick, and then we can uh, go to the next time. Uh, first of all, uh, Caleb, it, it, Caleb said a lot of things there. Uh, he mentioned the Communist Party and the CIO, what, you know, in the 1930s, Communist Party, Party USA endorsed Hillary Clinton for president in 2016. OK, so give me a break with the comments. That's not party. accurate. Uh, they the, they urged people to vote against Donald Trump, but they did not endorse Hillary Clinton. Oh, in that case. Well, OK, so plus the, like, like the, the, the cliche on the, the left is that the CPU USA are just edgy okay. Democrats. We're talking about so, 80 years se later. Se I'm second, sorry. I mean, secondly, like, OK, secondly. you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, second, I mean, that's that's like you're saying something about Hitler. And I say, well, George Lincoln Rockwell in the 70s said that doesn't prove okay. anything. So you're not you're not that's endorsing that's Hillary. Clinton. You're just saying vote. That's for a the, completely for the irrelevant. Democrat against Trump. What does that okay. have to do with anything? Fair enough. What does that okay. have to do with the fact? So, oh, them second thing, Hillary Clinton, eighty years Caleb later, Caleb isn't a member of CPUSA. The unions weren't built. Is that what you're saying? Do you? No, are you really that's not what I'm Democrat saying. What I what I am saying. What I am saying here. That I'm wrong about. What I am you. saying here are, is that you you're nuts? talking about an I mean, oh, outdated, okay. an outdated uh, form of the Communist Party that has no bearing on what communists do today. Because the communists today are really led largely by the DSA. And I know you don't like Trump. He talked about China. He didn't say anything about the DSA. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. No, I, the I point mean, is, the point is this. Throw point all is this. this guy Many says this guy says it. fascism yeah. is capitalism in crisis. Who was who who did the Len Lease support in the war when when the Germans and the Soviets signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, and they both invaded Poland around the same That's time. False. That's false. Who did the British declare war on over the sovereignty of Poland? It was the Germans. They decided yes, because, between yeah, the, the two that the ones who get punished for the sovereignty the of Poland the were forced to the, sign the, the Germans. Pact second of all, they had gone to the all relationship, the, the, the well, idea. Hang on, hang on, hang on. What second, you're saying, right. what's going on right here is you're taking a very selective reading of history. The fact is, is that early on fascist movements had the support of the liberal capitalist class, which is why, for instance, Francisco Franco, uh, even though the United States had officially said they would not get involved in the Spanish Revolution, um, specifically, Texaco fronted Franco with the world's first credit card, where he gave Franco all of the oil that he needed to run his war machine without After the United the States. War. No, no, before the war and with no money down. He the Phalangist movement the was the Phalangist movement was openly anti-capitalist. The yeah, arms that yeah, Franklin Delano again, Roosevelt was can be openly anti-capitalist. Congress, but the Congress, the had, the Congress, still Congress, believe Congress, that. Congress had told Franklin Delano Roosevelt to send to send arms, for example, to Finland to fight against the Soviets, and he never did it. 
Uh, the same is true for many different people, brigands. Basically, again, it would it Jewish doesn't matter. The in America only, who got together to go Spanish fight in Spain on behalf of the communists with the full support yeah. of the U.S. government. Oh no, no, no government. not the full support of the U.S. Yes, government. The U.S. Oh, yes. government officially this, had a position of neutrality in the United conflict. States. The United States. Okay, the United oh, States boy. government. And the Soviet Union reestablished relations in 1933. It was the son of a Jewish banker named Litvinov, the foreign minister, who, gives a crap who, met, who, it was. who met with Henry Morgenthau, another Jewish banker, who to cares? reestablish relationships between the so-called most rapacious capitalist power and the worst Stalinist power. So yeah, give me it's, a break it's amazing that, that, that when fascism is the enemy, is the enemy what, there's some strange the bedfellows in war. Right, so wait, then wait, the wait, capitalists wait, don't support the fascists. Wait a second, though. Hold on. Hold on. The fascists initially, then they realized how evil people are. Hold on. Hold on with me. Just one second. Bring this under control. We've got two or three people speaking at the same time. Is I promise. Let's just take. World War II, folks. Eric knows stuff about World War II. That proves the communists didn't raise people out of poverty. That's what we who did that. Who did no, the one, no one's, no one's talking side? about that. No one's talking about that. Can I, can I actually to respond to something point. that uh, Mike the, had said? Uh, by the way? original point here. Let's go. let's one sec. Let's go back to that original point that Brenton was wanting to address. Go ahead, Brenton. Mm -hmm. OK, so I, this actually goes back to something Mike had said. Um, now, there were three points here. I'm going to do two really quickly. And if I have time, I'm going to do number three. Mike, you asked. Why who, can't you just do one and then we'll trade off? One? OK, I'll do one. Um, so I'll just move straight to my main one here. You said that uh, this isn't about hate, that this is about white people's self-determination. But mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that's a lie. You had on your program a man by the name of uh, oh geez, how did... Jalen D. LaRay. Oh, he's boy. an ex-mercenary, and I assume he's an ex-mercenary in the well, way that everybody in a small town. Uh, so like, what? Like somebody said, I'm not, he I mean, came on your cares? program and he said there is no version of segregation that will ever work. Because all right, well, I disagree with that position. I disagree didn't disagree with, with him on the show. Well, all right, then, well, so what? You actually you supported okay. him on the show. You said you said that's. Tough. I don't. I Just agree. I sure. agree that segregation is not an ideal position. I I actually agree. I yeah, don't think you, you should have for the segregation. That you have to kill all of the blacks. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I do not accept the characterization that that's what I'm saying. And of course, that's this, what he you're was gonna, Of course, you're gonna, well. He's wrong. He, well, good. I'm he's glad wrong. you acknowledge that. And, he's wrong. and that's not the point of this. See, you're, this is exactly. But why are you going to bring somebody on your show who's an uh, unironic exterminationist? Like I'm not going to do that on my show. Caleb's not going to do that on his. Oh, really? So you don't you don't so you don't believe in class struggle where you're going to basically exterminate the bourgeoisie? You don't believe in that? No, I okay, don't. First off, class oh, struggle okay. isn't going to exterminate the bourgeoisie. And Mal right, 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 listen, you. I don't listen, advocate listen. murder. This well, idea, I want to respond to something Stalin else. Because we, it's true. We haven't heard. Much I would from kick Mike Stalin yet. and Mao off Chinese my program. We haven't, we haven't heard. We haven't heard much. All right. All right. So let's kick it over to Mike. The, the point here is gentlemen, that gentlemen, the, the work issue, with me, guys, please. kick it over to Mike. Let we him have not respond. heard much from Mike yet. The Go issue ahead, here that I keep hearing this idea that, uh, you know, and I've heard this before. I was a communist at one point in my youth. I was I was interested in Marxism and I was I was, also, I was interested in anarchism. I abandoned that for Marxism. And then I, I realized that a lot of this stuff is is not really well put together. This idea that fascism is the bourgeoisie in crisis, is capitalism's crisis, fascism is called upon to rescue capitalism when it's in crisis, is, it seems to me ridiculous because the biggest, the capitalist and communist powers of the world teamed up together to destroy the one national socialist state that existed. Yeah, and this, this is, this is, to, and this is not the first years. time, this is not the first time that this has happened. Uh, so Germany when you have who in reality is the one that is right now, let's talk about right now. Let's talk about right now. Who in reality right now is supported by the police state and the FBI in repressing people, nationalists that want to protest against open borders, want I mean, to protest for white workers. What in reality happened? What in reality? No, no. What in reality happens right now? Who is actually teaming up? With the FBI, that is actually have secret connections with the Sorry, FBI. Al Turner actually was, are was a that, white supremacist, and the FBI paid for his program. Yeah, he, was yes, he was an FBI informant. He was, informant. He was an FBI informant. One second. Well, let's, they gave let's, him let's, millions let's, of dollars to breach yes, the same as a police guys. informant. Well, I'll, I'll come right back to you, Caleb. Guys, yeah, moderators Caleb. talking. I'll come Listen. right back to you, Caleb. I, I just let's let Mike finish up this question, and I promise Hal Caleb will come right back to you. Hal Turner was an F was was an FBI informant. Obviously, when you have a movement that the establishment feels threatened by. They're interested in finding people inside these movements and turning them so that they can spy on people, so that they can get evidence on them, so that they can try and 
pin, uh, get them uh, pinned down in show trials and things like that. Like I was involved in a show trial, which fortunately I was able to beat by being, you know, pretty smart about my legal strategy. But the point is that when you actually have right to today, do you see Antifa? Do you see com people that self-styled communists or anarchists or whatever they want to call themselves? Who is it that is actually out there supporting the system and supported by the system? These are people who go Just out so and violently attack. Can you Just be more specific about that? Second. Yeah, yeah so I'll tell you. I will, I will I will go read any number to, of, of, of sorry, media I, outlets. I know very well that, that are speaking on behalf of the homes of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. I've seen lots of political repression. Uh, I mean, this is this notion. The FBI showed up with my friend. Don't the, the, the Freedom Road, the Freedom Road Socialist Organization is a tanky group. Those I have a I have a friend who is in jail right now okay, for so one year in upstate New York for Antifa so activities. Gone from, what did he do? From did he attack they, somebody? Uh, he he was involved in a street communist. fight, he and they decided they to make an exact. Okay, so he assaulted somebody. someone. Okay. Oh, he assaulted somebody. Okay. I don't so there you go. I know him very well. In fact, I saw at the Invictus debate, he was the guy that that one of the Proud Boys tried to attack out well, of the proud out boys let's proud go. boys are in jail One for second. defending got... themselves from attack okay <laughs> the proud boys essentially were exiting a building when they were attacked by antifa thugs that is a lie masks. no it's not yeah, a lie even to video. Admitted video. that was a we lie it it's happen. on video the fact that these guys yeah, exactly lost the fight it's doesn't mean they didn't start it they lost okay. the fight i don't, I don't care start about who starts what maybe but like that's what matters when you said you said you wanted to have a real discussion please don't Please then you, okay. then stop yelling over me. Buddy. All right, the the moderator. Wanna I don't want to mute people because I feel like I you guys are our guests, so I you know the, the right. reason we have you on is to but hear you guys. Guy, so, you got to control this one guy because he keeps streaming over people. Like, so, I don't want to be yelling. I want to make my point, but he gets upset and he can't control himself. Let's give uh we'll kick it back to Mike for a brief right, and Mike just as as you yourself had said, we are kind of just one point at a time and then we'll kick it back over to Brenton or Caleb. Right. So the Proud Boys. In terms of that, they were attacked and ambushed, and they they defended themselves. Nobody, I think, should be put in jail for winning a fight that someone else starts. You say, "Who? What does it matter who starts it? What matters who starts it is that's how you delegate responsibility in a violent act altercation. The person that throws the first punch, person that throws the first rock, the person that throws the first bottle, is the one that's that's uh, morally responsible for the fight. Nobody uh, condemns someone for defending themselves, and if you defend yourself and win. Good for you. So no, I don't. I'm, I take the Proud Boy side in that 100. I've seen the videos, and I've also gotcha. been myself involved in street protests where we were out there to uh, engage in our constitutional right to protest, and we were assaulted by people calling themselves Antifa. We didn't start it. You, whatever you hear in the media, you know, the media, of course, backs Antifa. They are another arm of Antifa. Just I mean, Antifa, anti-fascism is the ruling ideology of the United States at the time right now. Now, gotcha. you might say, oh, gotta, that's different. Do I'm do special and I'm a different Mike. kind of anti-fascism. But I this is the facts. Here? Okay, let him talk. Okay, so uh, right. Caleb or Brenton? Yeah. So you asked um, really quickly, you asked uh, where we come from, where the United States comes from uh, criticizing Germany. Um, that is a two quoque fallacy. The fact is, is that even if the United States or anyone else is a hypocrite, that doesn't make them wrong. A doctor who tells you not to smoke, if that doctor smokes, it's still good, sound medical advice. So straight up there, that's just a non-argument. Now, White people, you mentioned this, white people have a right to collective self-organizing. Here's the problem. Race isn't real. Okay. Or rather, it's All real right. in the kind of way that money is real. Or in the way right, that gender is real. What do you it's, put down on the census? It's pretty freaking Mike, real to me, Mike, man. So put down all the like census, Take it to the Mike, store and buy product. Can, can I finish? Can Mike. I finish? Can I finish? Race is a mental tool. It is used by sovereign power as a means of managing populations that it thinks are unmanageable. The whole thing going, it looks at a group of people, says, oh, you people are shady. Everyone is like this, like it. So, you know, watch it, buddy. That's the reason ideology, white people fine. are not subjected to this. They do not feel the, the state doesn't feel they need to manage us unless we go out. And for instance, like with your groups, you mentioned you, you were responsible for 100 percent of the politically motivated violence in 2018, with the exception you were also I'll, up there. I'll uh, respond to that when he's done. So, yeah, you, thank you. You can respond to that when I'm done um, no, with uh, the exception of uh, sovereign citizens. Uh, the fact is, is that whiteness is not a race. It is a lack of racialization. It, the government doesn't come up to me and look at me and say, hey, Brent looks shady because he's white. It looks at me and it says, hey, Brent looks shady because he looks like a rudderless hippie. 
Oh, gotcha. it, it is completely right. different when you move on to different uh, groups. And you, you say like white people can't get okay. together and organize. Caleb and I met at Occupy Wall Street. You're bitch your ass we got in there and organized. I do want to. Okay. Yeah. On the basis let, of let white me, let me, let me let me respond. Not on the basis of white determination because white Eric isn't a thing. So then let, on the basis of let me, let me, let me, go here. Let me, let me talk. Okay. First of all, uh, the idea that white is a social construct, whatever. Uh, first of all, race is a social construct. Okay, race is a social construct. Well, tell that to all. Tell that tell you know that what to China. No, no, no. Hold, hold on. on. I hold will. On. Tell, no, hey, hold China, on. Race hold is on. Let me, let me, let me, let me talk. Let me talk. Tell that to the Freedom Road Socialist Party that supports ethno states for every single race, separate ethno states. They call it the right to self determination. Okay, screw those blacks. Guys. Puerto Ricans, uh, I think in Mexico, Chicanos and fucking uh, uh, Asians and everyone. OK, yeah, Black. I've seen those maps. It's they're that, ridiculous. That, yes. That's what the free. That's what the Freedom Road Socialist Party. Your buddy, Caleb. Seems OK, awesome. screw the Freedom Road Socialist Party. OK, they believe in race. OK, yeah. so, Sorry, so Caleb, what do you have? What I'm saying what I'm saying is that if we live in a country, let's pretend for a second that, you know, all science is 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 nonsense, that 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 science isn't real. <laughs> that genetics aren't real and that, in fact, uh, uh, let's pretend I'll, I'll grant you that for a second, just as a thought experiment. Let's mm -hmm. pretend for a second. If everyone else believes that everyone else of every other race believes that it's in your interest as a white man to organize right. on those foundations as well, because if not, you will be a single solitary figure against a group. So it's a form of collective identity. That's where people get power from. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to address the, the, the hoax. You know, you always say, oh, uh, uh, we're not liberals, we're radicals, and we're radical anti-fascists. We lead the anti-fascists with communism and socialism. Well, bro, you're reading shit from the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is funded I'm by millionaires and Southern millionaires and billionaires. Center. You're reading statistics collect collected by the anti-defamation. No, I'm not. A group. Well, that's those are the people. Where well, are you? Excuse getting? me, friend. Excuse Daniel me. Daniel Harper says hi. Let me let me let me finish. Yeah, here, he, friend. Let me finish. Let me finish. People. Daniel Harper is also a Warren guy. So you know what? Who cares? What, what do you mean a, a Warren guy? Liberal. Like he's into Elizabeth Warren? Yes, he's a shame. rad lib. He's a rad lib. Yeah, who so gives anyway. A Okay. Let's, let's, that wouldn't have Eric, anything to do with let, let me just finish my point. One or two more points, and then let me just finish my point. Let me just finish my point about the the, the crime, the crime mm, statistics. Yeah. Where uh, the the anti defamation league were the ones who came up with the statistics that white nationalists lead in terrorism and killing people, or rather. But you know what? What group were these people in? Were they in the Ku Klux Klan? Were they in the National Socialist Movement? Were they a Traditionalist Worker Party? A Day Europa? Anything? The closest, the only thing they can get is the the Charlottesville death of Heather Heyer, which you know I'm not going to expect you to grant me. I'm not going to expect you to grant me that it's it's a gray area. But I will say this: How many people are killed every year in the name of anti-racism? Have you heard about the Molson plant attack, where six? Innocent workers were shot to death by a crazy black man who said he did it because the white people there were racist. He did it in the name of anti-racism. On top of that, when it when it hit Connor Twitter, bets. the mass media, the mass media applauded it. Washington Post for an article <laughs> rationalizing it. And people right. on Twitter were saying, oh, maybe he was right to kill those innocent people. There's no there's out. no evidence. The very fact innocent. that the mass Let's media went behind Caleb. that is showing me that you're lying about this. Let's kick the it Washington over Post wrote an article rationalizing it. Yeah, I'll read the article later. Yeah. You, you okay. send right. a number of points from uh, Eric. We'll go. Caleb, Caleb can, can, can Caleb talk? He's been a while. Or I, if you want me, I can First respond. Caleb. Let me make clear, I have nothing to do with Antifa. I know nothing okay. about Antifa altercations, and I, I'm not interested in debating that kind of thing. Ditto. Uh, Brent is free to, to talk about that if he wants, but I, that's not my... I, I don't have anything to do with piece. Antifa either. I, I support As far as more. the Second World War, and I know we don't want to debate the Second World War too much, but the, the issue was that after the First World War, Germany was stripped of its colonies. Uh, it had been an imperial power. It had been stripped of its colonies. Under Hitler, uh, the you know industrial capitalists like Krupp and Tyson, centered around Hallemer Schacht, a banker, took control of the government. They crushed the communists. They exterminated the labor movement. They outlawed strikes. Uh, they put a whole bunch of people in concentration camps. They restarted armaments manufacturing. And then they went about trying to reclaim territory and colonies. And the British let them do it for a long time. Neville Chamberlain, want, they were people were very happy. They thought they would get rid of the Soviet Union for them. But they pushed it too far and they became competitors with the British and the Americans. And at the point that they became competitors with the British and the Americans, uh, the British and the Americans then teamed up with the Soviet Union. 
But prior to the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the Soviet Union had gone to France, it had gone to Germany, or not Germany, obviously, it had gone to the United States, to the British, and asked them to form an anti-fascist coalition, and this was denied. Uh, Henry Ford was a huge admirer of the Nazis, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers, Henry Morgan. They even attempted a fascist a military coup against Roosevelt. You can call it, you read about it, it's called the business plot, right? Because Roosevelt was helping working people and giving them things like social security and education and supporting their labor unions. Uh, because of that, strike breakers like the, uh, the, you know, Black Legion, like the Silver Legion of America, like the Ku Klux Klan, uh, you know, you guys claim you support working people, but but throughout the history of fascism, fascists are an army of strike breakers. Every time workers want their rights, uh, the fascists are called up to come and beat the beat the strikers down because they're a bunch of commies. We got to beat them back. They're commies, don't you know? Uh, you know, and and this is the weird thing. You guys claim to be critical of capitalism, whether it's Hitler, whether it's Mussolini, whether it's George Lincoln Rockwell. Every fascist speech I've ever heard begins with communists are evil. Communists need to be exterminated hatred for communists that is central that is just absolutely central right and and you know you look at libya right i mean i mean libya was freed from colonialism and broke out of western capitalism under gaddafi with the islamic socialist model but it was mussolini who brutally murdered people all across libya you know i mean omar Mukhtar but it was, was the united murdered, states that brutally murdered Ethiopia. gaddafi you know it was the united the states that brutally murdered gaddafi that, that took money we'll give, and we'll guns from gaddafi. 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 gaddafi another gaddafi was torn gaddafi. apart gaddafi. by gaddafi. like a mob of his own Hold people on one second. Well, well, yeah, let's, how did that happen we're going to let caleb let's let caleb finish up and then we'll go over mike like south africa like rhodesia Right. I mean, I mean, you guys aren't anti-globalist. You're not anti-capitalist. You're strike breakers. You're in favor of colonialism and imperialism. You, you know, maybe you're with a faction that isn't dominant in it. The British, the British Empire is horrendous. There's no no question about it. Winston Churchill was a monster. He's responsible for yeah. that million. And he's your no, fellow. No, no, no argument from us. Pretty soon here, pretty soon here, pretty soon here but, I want to kick it over. The only Mike. problem a lot Hitler of points, had was that he, he wasn't as good at it as him. I mean, it was the Germans wanted to do what the British were doing. They were jealous. They wanted they wanted to compete. Gotcha. We'll kick it over to Mike. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, yeah, I wanted to actually talk about Shaq for a second. It's really funny that you mentioned him because Stryker and I were just talking about him today on our show when we were talking about uh, basically the economic uh, plan that Hitler put in place in 1933. His first four year plan it wasn't a five year plan like, you know, China does and like uh, the Stalinists did. Uh, and in fact, Shaq was on, he, I believe he was one of the top uh, bankers in Germany. But Hitler regularly referred to him as a tool of globalist liberalism, and he didn't listen to him. The person that engineered the economic uh, turnaround in Germany, which nobody can deny, actually. No one can deny the economic turnaround between 1933 and 1938 in Germany. And the armaments manufacturer actually didn't start up again until around 1938. Uh, this was not how they revitalized their economy. A lot of the programs that they did, I could list them off. You would probably agree with them, and I agree with them. And these are the kinds of things I would like to see the United States do today. And I think that these could be done in a very effective way, such as large infrastructure projects, uh, giving people direct uh, money handouts to people in order to buy products, to refurbish their homes, to buy furniture, to buy cars. This is all part of it. And that increased demand, increased production. And it brought Germany back from the brink that they had been, you know, one, their currency had been destroyed by the, uh, you know, the agreement post-war that the, the other powers, um, had, had uh, subjected them to along with the reparations. I mean, we can go into a long history of this, but Schacht was not the guy that did this. It was, what was his name? Reinhardt. I forget his, was it Fritz? Fritz Reinhardt, striker? Tell me, uh, I get that right? Re Reinhardt, yes. Yeah. Reinhardt was actually the master of the four-year yes, plan. Yes, he was, he was the economic advisor who, who came Schacht. up with the first four-year plan, which uh, managed to shrink German unemployment to something like 400,000 people Reinhardt. from like millions of people to about 400,000 people had managed to bring their economy back, had increased production in, uh, you know, appliances, autos, furniture, had brought back agriculture and, and all of this. So this, this is this is the kind of programs that the uh, National Socialists engaged upon in their first four years. So yeah. you could talk about how like they, they only did it by bringing the boot down on this or that guy. And it was just brutal capitalism. It wasn't. They didn't. The, 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 the fact that they were funded by capitalists is, is simply a, a lie that the Soviet Union put out there later on. The, the National Socialist Party was initially funded by it, contributions wow, from man. from members. And so now we you're never going to believe that. So I don't expect you to grant it. But like uh, it, it is true. 
And so the point is that this is this is this. They they were not supported by big capital. And in fact, why is it that these uh, that the big capitalist powers like you're not going to find in me any apologist twenty five seconds British Empire for Winston Churchill or for the United States government. You're not I'm not going to these these in my opinions are some of the most monstrous governments. I mean, you want to talk about people that gas people there and Winnie Churchill right there. He's a poison gas man. He wants those are the real gas. Antifa. He wanted, wanted to, to and that guy. Yeah, that's a real FDR. anti-fascist right we there. Wanna, those are the hey, real anti fascists kick it over. Caleb's that's hero, a FDR. good number of points. I'm, I'm basically doing like a three minute interval. So All right, let's go. Let's we'll, just do it. to, it's been we've got a good rhythm now. So we'll kick it back over to Brenton. Okay, oh, so uh, first off, you said um, the uh, all this stuff about um, uh, social programs that we have, and Caleb can go more into that than me, but what I'm going to tell you right off the bat is you can have those social programs without a racial component, and you can have them without stealing from a minority group, which is exactly what they did. Um, but I wanted to actually go back to something that Stryker uh, had brought up, because he said we throw science under the bus, uh, and this comes from a paper, Genetic Similarities Within Human Populations. Oh, boy. Our analysis focuses on the frequency of W with which a pair of random individuals from two different populations is genetically more similar than a pair of individuals randomly selected from a single population. Yeah, Richard Lewontin. W, no, it's is uh, Witherspoon, Wooding, Mancini, Batzer, and Jard. Um, okay. W remains the same, even when using uh, populations as distinct as sub-Saharan Africans and Europeans. Phenotype controlled by a dozen or fewer loci can therefore be expected to show substantial overlap between human populations. This provides empirical justification for caution when using population labels in biomedical settings with broad implications for personalized medicine, pharmacogenetics, and the meaning of race. Now, what does that mean in simple terms? It means that because of the way genetics functions within human populations, I can have more genetically similar with somebody from sub-Saharan Africa than I do with Caleb or any of you. And the same is true for you guys. The fact is, is that genetics moves through human population in a bucket chain. It moves like waves underneath the surface. Each group of people breeds with the group next to them. Then that group breeds with the group next to them and the group next to them. And suddenly these genetics tra- travel all over the planet. Furthermore, genetics cannot, f- it does not support race because of what we what we think of as the Toba catastrophe theory. Uh, at one point in our history, the Toba volcano exploded. It was a super volcano and it wound up reducing uh, the population of humans on the planet to some 2000 or so individuals. Uh, all of us come from those 2,000. Humans are one of the most, or I'm sorry, one of the least uh, genetically diverse species on the planet. There is almost more genetic diversity in a single flock of pigeons than the entire human species. So there is no genetic basis for race. This is an illusion that is created by because it was uh, co- it was convenient for the great powers uh, of Europe. Um, and it and it's starting to no longer be a thing because it is less convenient and also because we have learned to look beyond our animal natures and we're continuing okay. to move towards well, a you're saying race is in the animal nature so then that's race that kind of contradicts we'll go for just let me, let me, let me, let me, let me back over to you we can come back over to you I just let him finish forgive me for cutting you off but just to we're going to let Brenton finish you got about roughly 60 seconds Brenton and then we'll go over to Eric over there. Okay. What I'm going to say is that does not contradict. The battle uh, between compassion and hatred is in each and every one of our hearts. There are savage parts of our nature and there are beautiful parts of our nature. And racism and seeing grouping people into race is dropping into that lizard brain, that dumb guy rule that goes, oh, that looks different than me. Me no like. And, uh, when the fact is we are all so m- much more similar than like anybody even had an idea. And this is a, an objective genetic fact. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah. Well, I mean, after that, you know, the, the, the idea, sure, you can find, you can quote a paper uh, of, of any kind for any reason. The founder, the, the reason why you're not going to get open debate on race and open affirmation of race by scientists is frankly because the the academic the academic structure will shut you down, ruin your life, and make you die as a evildoer. Well, they do to Watson, right? If you well, that's what I was getting at. James Watson, the very person who discovered DNA, the geneticist who discovered it, uh, when he, he said that that race well, is real and intelligence and intelligence is is part of race that you can 
predict intelligence based on race. They took away all of his titles. They took away all of his awards. And the man, his life is ruined. This is an elderly person's life is ruined. Because yeah, so he said a bunch can, of bullshit. I, you're Hold not on, letting. You're not. You're. Oh, so you agree with the state, like like you, shitting you all agree, over a scientist you agree and ruining with the his life? Order because, as, yeah. So then you're you just agree with well, the liberal well, order because you think this well, scientist let me, broke let me, a taboo. Let me, and let me, and he even a step clock is the right place. Let me let me necessarily agree with the liberal order, but I'm sorry, I interrupted. It's my mistake. Okay. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Universities, science. Science and the academy are two different things, okay? Because sci- the, the, the science, as you guys, I assume, as people that have a class analysis at the very least, will understand that private universities depend on private grants many times from billionaires with their own motives who expect a certain conclusion from science. That's why the Pritzkers, a, a transvestite, is funding the University of Medicine in Chicago <laughs> to pretend that trannies are like that a man can become a woman. And you can laugh all you want, and you can probably cite me 10 studies about how a biological man can be a woman. The problem is we, the people, the majority know that that's stupid. Just There's like no such Caleb's, thing as a biological just, man. Just, just, well, just like, in, yeah, exactly. Just like See, okay, Caleb's so, utopia of the Soviet Union. I don't even Union. think I need hold to argue against this finish. guy now. Let me Let's fucking say, finish. I mean, are we just gonna yeah, you don't want to argue hold about it. Just, just like, just like in Caleb's... Let's strike her finish. Let's strike her finish. Just like in Caleb's Stalinist utopia... The, the Soviet government said that we must prove Lamarckism, Lamarckism, which is a, an attack on, on Mendelian genetics, that we must stay, stick to this line because it's part of our political ideology. And so this goes back to what me and Mike are saying. Liberalism is the true anti-fascism. Li- neoliberal capitalism is anti-fascism. Because that is the one that breaks down collective identities of race, of gender. You think, not, not for nothing, Brenton, but if you went to the USSR and you went around uh, talking about how men are actually not real and that men can become women, they would put you in a mental institution. So give me a break. No one actually believes in this stuff. This is pure ideological propaganda funded okay, by billionaires a, who give money to We're universities to... that come to these conclusions. We're I just want to say one thing about Caleb. race. Well, okay, hold on man. one sec. I, I, just to keep it, because we've got such a good rhythm. Go ahead, Caleb. Okay. okay. Well, um, and it's interesting. There claims to be this opposition to the British Empire, but I'm hearing scientific racism, which is something the British Empire widely promoted. Um, I'm hearing, you know, too. seeing in fascist states, colonialism, uh, and, and that's something the British Empire knew about pretty well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing all of this, this criticism of Winston Churchill, which is, which is great. But I'm seeing people who actually believe in the ideas that he extolled. Uh, I mean, this is this is pretty ridiculous. Now, um, as far as the the point about uh, you know, I mean, when you talk about, I mean, I'm hearing you know all this scientific racism. That's the latest. I'm hearing attempts to claim that uh, that, that that you know that somehow the Soviet Union were the bad guys in the Second World War. Again, this is what we're hearing from NATO right now, right? This is this is Timothy Snyder of Yale. That this this narrative that Hitler was the good guy in World War II and the evil Russians are the bad ones. That's, that, is, that is the narrative being pushed by the European Union. That's the narrative being pushed in Poland where they're tearing down World War II memorials. I, um, you know, I mean, this, you guys are pushing, this is CNN. This is CNN, right? Well, you know, Stalin killed more people than owned Hitler. By, you know, owned by Jeffrey Zucker. Union the real CNN bad guys. Saying, we never said still, that. Do this. This is CNN. Sure, I never said people. that. Give meanwhile, me break, meanwhile, you, I mean, when it gets down to it, you all are Zionists, right? Your whole platform is you want to create a white man's Israel. Well, I'll tell you. Israel, look at the Middle East. That That's whole the Black thing Panthers didn't turn out too well. So I don't Warrior. think carving out a white man's Israel in the middle of the United States in 2020 is going to work out too well either, right? You guys love racial separ- sep- supremacist states. You love apartheid in South Africa. You love Rhodesia. But somehow you don't like Israel just because you don't like Jews, because you're bigots. That's all it is, right? You guys love the British Empire. You love scientific racism. You believe some people are better than others. You're not, you, you are not anti-capitalist. You believe basically what this system believes in natural hierarchies and all of that, just in a way, way amped up level. That's really the only difference between you guys and this, the established order. And let me make the point about anti-fascism. You say liberalism is the anti-fascism. Well, the CIA, you know, with the Congress for Cultural Freedom program, with, uh, you know, you talk about Susan Sontag and Theodore Adorno, they funded like crazy all kinds of so, so-called anti-fascism, and that was to er- erase the Marxist anti-fascism. 
They had Operation Gladio to make sure that the communists didn't win the elections in Italy after the Second World War because the population loved the communists so much because they had been anti-fascist fighters with their partisan brigades, right? That, that the liberal anti-fascism that you're critiquing was created to prevent people from adopting Marxist anti-fascism. That's really what it's about. Marxists yeah, understand fascism in a scientific way, in an economic way. Uh, this this psychoanalytic thing that you know that fascism is the result of a lack of masturbation and sexual freedom or some weird stuff. You know, Wilhelm Reich and all of that. That's not Marxism. They hate Marxism. They have done their best to water it down to That's oppose what it. And, and what you're ranting against, uh, what you label Marxism, uh, you know, is not Marxism, right? I mean, we're gonna we talked about well, the Soviet yeah. Union. Uh, yeah. There, I mean, I'm sorry, but if you, if you compare what people are the preaching, the commentator said the German social democrats switch it over. Democrats. Democrats. We've got to switch it over to Mike. I'm sorry, actual Marxism exists. We've got to switch it over to Mike. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Well, Please actually, I, I, first of all, I, I don't actually disagree with you when you're saying that a lot of the the Antifa stuff, the the sort of liberal, the sort of extreme uh, liberal Antifa that we see now, actually was. Uh, put in place uh, by the governments to freeze out with actual Marx. I, I agree with that. I think you're right about that. And, and as someone who has studied uh, Marxism, I don't just, I don't agree with a lot of it, but I think that it's certainly That's what your a movement step, preaches. A, a, a no, step no, I mean, well, communists. We need a revolution against communism. One sec, I, Caleb. I listen to one the sec. Right. It's Caleb, communist, communist, come on, Caleb, communist, work with me. Right. Okay, so go ahead, Mike. All right. So, <laughs> so thank you. Well, first of all. You know, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, I, I certainly think that, you know, tankyism or whatever you want to say, uh, say you are Marxist like this. This is certainly better than this sort of liberal, uh, like hyper liberal anti fa that we have now. I think your statements that, you know, the EU is supporting the idea. <laughs> Idea that the Nazis were the good guys in World War II is, is beyond is so completely absurd that I can't even really respond to. It. I mean, EU, if you go and you say something like that in most EU countries, you run the risk of getting put in jail. If, if you I mean, it is literally illegal. I mean, what's the biggest and most powerful country in the EU? It's Germany. They have a law against anything saying anything good about the Nazis. Literally, if they if they suspect you're trying to rehab the Nazis, you go to jail. And this is the most powerful country in the EU. So that's an absurd statement. And it, maybe if there's one academic, you, I, I don't I'm not familiar. There's one academic who's who said this recently in a paper or something. Fine. So that, that's not this is not like an establishment view that the Nazis were the good guys in World War Two. I mean, is. This, is, this is this is an absurd statement. Statement. And and it's and it, I can only assume that it's based on some kind of extreme perspective bias on your part. I mean, I don't want to accuse you of that, but it, it seems to me that an objective look at the United States and at the EU would not have you saying that they considered the uh, Nazis to actually have been the good guys. Now, it's true that General Patton thought so. And what happened to him? But, uh, you know, he, he kind of regretted everything that happened later on. And certainly there were some uh, people that went over for the trials and things like that. And they were like, wow, these show trials uh, are, are really kind of over the top. And this is kind of messed up. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that these these are absurd statements, this idea. I mean, and, and but let's look at right now uh, on the race thing. I would say, like, we could argue genetics. I don't I mean, I don't that's do white do two white parents have a white baby and do two black parents have a black baby. If you can show me white parents having a black baby and and uh, black parents having a white baby, then maybe I'll believe you until you can show that. I'm not talking about albinos because that's a specific congenital disorder. Oh, that I, see white Bre people... I see Brenton going to Google. He's going to Google. Right. Find so what I'm South saying, African it, well, whatever, like we all know. It. And again, you one... mentioned, you right, mentioned you gotta... Israel, like, you know, go preach to Israel this stuff, because that's if you're so against it. Why isn't Israel like number one on your enemies list? It's why, why are you here talking about totally out of power white men? In, in the United States that are actually trying to fight for some amount of political legitimacy and representation, you know, with the neoliberal order on the same, effectively the same side as the neoliberal order. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Going back to Brenton. Uh, let's see. Oh, hey. Oh, yeah, so sorry. You. I don't even remember muting you. I know. It was weird. I was actually telling everybody to listen to Mike. Um, okay. So, um, just to respond really quickly, um, the, the, the question that was asked to me is, why am I not more critical of Israel? Anyone that knows me knows that I am very critical of Israel. I have lost friends. I have lost employers because I have been sickened by what the Israelis have done to the Palestinians. And I have you won't lose them, you won't it. lose employment my, if you attack my, white my, nationalism. Work with me. Thank you. Um, all right. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing, as I said, race is based upon characteristics that are basically skin deep. They do not have a genetic basis. So parents can give birth to children that appear to be more white 
or or whatever. But the thing is, is that that perception, the fact that that is a race as opposed to natural variation within a race, for instance, uh, um, uh, gingers are not considered a separate race, even though they look incredibly different than the rest of us. That is distinct from I, actual I, I gen oppose genetics. This, hold on, gender gender I promise <laughs> we'll come back. They don't have souls. Uh, <laughs> I have that on good authority. Um, no, so uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is I've got here, because we brought up gender, I figured it might come up. Uh, this is actually from um, Nature, uh, journal. This is the most prominent scientific journal in the Western world. And this is about when uh, Trump was trying to have the basis of determining gender based upon your bio or like your, your sex organs. It has no foundation in science and would undo decades of progress on the understanding of sex, a classification based on internal and external bodily characteristics and gender, a social construct related to biological differences, but also rooted in culture, societal norms, and individual behavior. So you've got sex. Sex is your biology. It's your dangly bits and everything else and your chromosomes. Then you have gender. Gender is the part of society that looks at that and goes, hmm, this person has dangly bits, therefore they should. That is gender. That is what the idea of what a man is. Man and woman, these are ideals, like platonic ideals that exist along a bimodal spectrum that people of different sexes fit into. Secondly, the uh, genetics that we have shows that actual sex like classification for scientists is actually more complicated than simply male and female. And we know this because nature is a mad scientist and she doesn't give a crap what humans think about what a person's dangly bits mean. Clownfish, for instance, change sex when there are no females around. It's like, uh, which makes Finding Nemo all kinds of weird. But the fact is, is that it's not as simple as what we were all taught in school. Um, you have to look at this from a philosophical standpoint and through a lens like that. Don't just fall back on an argument of incredulity because the fact Ooh. is, is that we all this is, Eric. This I don't is, give a shit. <laughs> like, yeah, you don't care truth. about you don't right, care about exactly the working right, class exactly because right. you're Thank a, you a tool of the liberals. We're going to Eric here. You're, you're a tool of the liberals. And the only people that believe <laughs> that crap you just spouted are fucking rich Jewish liberals. Those are the only people that believe that nonsense that a man in a tutu is a woman. OK, yeah, I mean, you ask a guy, a guy to you at, a, at a, a real working person and tell them that stuff. They'll laugh in your face of any race, Why? by the way, of any race. Oh, no. If and if it's a black person, they'll probably punch you. <laughs> so give me a break with that stuff. I mean, it, it just discredits your argument when you go, oh, race isn't real, but also gender isn't real. And also all these things that are self-evident, things that are intuitive, things that 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 human beings have always believed forever that are true. That exactly. Are You're dumb. One sec. You, you have to let figure that out. Yeah, one sec. Exactly. <laughs> right. And all you can do to people that that realize that you guys, you liberals are full of shit is call them names. And that's why leftists can't win elections. Yeah. OK, that's why you you got you get blown out by the lamest conservatives in Europe, the lamest uh, freaking dollar store Donald Trump in, in Britain swept the British election. And it's not because people like him. It's because people hear people like you and they get freaked the hell out. OK, because you are only motivated by destruction. You are a what Edward Dutton would call a mutant. You are a person who just wants to destroy all forms of collective identity. Do you feel okay with like being a bad guy from uh, X-Men? One sec, one sec. Yes. Brent, I mean, just to let him know. I love the you, comic book reference here. This is your worldview. This is yeah, what encompasses your books. worldview. Oh, yeah. comic books, great. Well, who's a ba bad guy in X-Men was a Jew, by the way. But anyway, yeah. uh, on top of that, you know, the, the, the idea that, first of all, you call people dumb. Well, there's a lot of dumb people. I don't yeah. care if people are dumb. I'll, I'll advocate for dumb people. OK, also, some people if, are dumb. My point no, no, is but hold that on, let, let me that finish. Hold on one second. My, I'm, my... I'm, I'm kind of this three minute interval. I'm kind of letting okay, Eric so, and uh, yeah. and okay, uh, Mike me... share. So I, I promise okay. the next three minute interval, if you Brenton and, and Caleb, if you want to share it, you can. But just to keep it on one side for this part. Well, let, let me let me just say this, that, you know, the, 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 the look at the let's use a, a Marxist, a Marxist point of view on this how the only people that believe in this liberal maximalist ideology of sexual liberation, of homosexuality, of every lifestyle is legitimate, let's abolish the family, which, by the way, Engels believed as well. These things don't make the world a better place, okay? You know, you know it's been studied, actually, that one of the number one predictors 
of a person who will be successful in life is a strong family. Okay. And you people on the left, all you do is attack the traditional family. You want to abolish the traditional family. And the reason for that is that because many of you are in the bourgeoisie, you have strong families, you have privileges, economic privileges, connections, rich parents, about 10 whatever seconds. things that we working men, we don't have that. So we need our families. We need our race and we need our nation. That's gonna, the difference between us. It doesn't matter it what some pseudoscience from Nature magazine, which says all kinds of crap. Switch it over to Caleb. Okay, I, I think we, we got that last point, and then we're going to switch over to Caleb. And uh, and like I said, if you guys want to split it, whatever way you you want, you can. And this yeah. is probably I'm trying to remember who how we started with these intervals. Uh, at one point, if one side is willing to yield to the other, otherwise I'll flip a coin in terms of who will go last before we go into the Q and A. Although, if I remember right, we do have closings of which you guys can basically choose how much of your five minute closing you'll use. And so maybe I think that we did start when we did this interval thing. Caleb, I think, was the last person on the first round. So maybe what we'll do is we'll go Caleb for this three minutes and then we'll go into the closing statement, starting with Mike, then going Brenton. Well, Eric, I would like to have Caleb. the last word in the we're, closing we're gonna... because Caleb got the last word on the opening. Yeah. We're, Either Stryker or myself. Well, wait, Stryker got the first word, though. Right. Oh, okay. All right. So, okay, that's fine. I just want like, but... You want it to be fair. It's cool. We'll, we'll make yeah. sure it's fair. Uh, you said me and Caleb can take this really quickly, because it would actually be... Go, uh, yeah, right. Yeah, for, for three ahead. minutes before, would, the, yeah. uh, before so we start Really quickly, I just want to add off. Um, so, so Stryker, wait, wait, I'm wait, wondering wait, if you wait. work in a... I'm really wondering if you work in a movie theater, because that was some epic levels of projection. Uh, the idea that me and Caleb are like representatives of the bourgeoisie dude we were both on the ground at occupy wall street i was kneading the so spine by a who was i was i was I at occupy wall street okay well, there was like I a thousand everybody. people there i was kneading the spine by a cop and thrown through a line of motorcycles both of us bo bonded over covering the cecily mcmillan trial uh we have seen the way that the state treats um radicals I, I saw it myself when like Bloomberg um, ordered the NY, like he, he made a, an agreement with the editor of the New York Times that he would take his side before he cleared Zuccotti Park. And they deployed freaking police helicopters to prevent coverage from uh, the air and, they, and to prevent journalists like Caleb from covering it from the ground. So don't tell us that we're not working class or whatever. Also, Bloomberg I'm married with a child. Time. Caleb is married. Neither one of us are attacking the, the family. Like, I, I'm hearing some some pain, and I don't mean that in a, in, a, in a, you know, obviously, you got some family issues. And that's okay. A lot of people do. But like the well, thing is, don't don't. Yeah. What, I'm is, uh, what I'm saying is, what I'm what I'm saying is, don't project <laughs> right, that onto us. Like don't assume that we're that these liberals that you ha, that you've talked to, that these other um, places are making arguments that we're not. Don't put words in our mouth. That's just that's what all, I want to say. No, so sorry, Caleb, go, the only man. people that believe in transgenderism are liberals, Caleb. and then you're uh, one of them. Let's go back to Caleb. Right. Well, it doesn't matter if you believe in it or not. It's a fact. We've got like maybe. Caleb, uh, if you want to make a, I think we have enough for you to make like a single quick point. Uh, otherwise, we'll go to closing statements. Well, I think I'll just explain, you know, I guess, first of all, um, I, I want to respond, I guess, to what Mike said earlier, because this narrative uh, that the Soviet Union was not heroic in fighting fascism is being pushed widely by the establishment right now. Uh, you know, from Harvard, from Yale. I mean, go to the go to the bookstore. You'll find loads of books trying to say that the Soviets were worse than the Nazis. Uh, the, the the Soviet anti-fascism was not heroic. They're tearing down World War II memorials right now. Uh, people are being threatened uh, for for honoring uh, anti-fascist resistance fighters all over Eastern Europe. And I will add that after the Second World War, uh, the United States embraced people who talk like you all over the world. They reinstalled the Shah of Iran, a brutal dictator who actually referred to his people as Aryans and had been- Why are you characterizing me? I don't support the, the Shah at all. I'm very pro-Iran. In Ukraine, pro we're, in Ukraine we're gonna, we're gonna uh, the government that's installed really there agrees with your narrative of World War II. You guys have the NATO, European Union narrative of World War II that the Russians were the main bad guys uh, and and that, that's just a fact, okay? I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Look at anything about Russia. Look at anything about World War II history being pushed by the American establishment. You get this message that the Soviets were the main bad guys. That's, just that's to keep just to keep the times totally equal. I'm so sorry to interrupt, Caleb, but just to be fair, uh, 
I think with that single point, we'll move into the closings. And so thanks so much for your patience, fellows. It's been a wild one. We will kick it over to Mike for the first closing statement. Do I understand right? You had a concern. I think that. Well, no, one we, of them goes first so that we can have the last closing statement. Okay. I'm trying to remember because generally the advantage goes to the very first statement and then the very last statement. And so I'm trying to remember who started. I think you're right. Striker. So, okay. okay. So what I go. Okay. So no, 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 wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The, the opening statements went Stryker, Brenton, Brent. me, Caleb. So let's do it in reverse. But let's, let's, I want, I want, I want one of us to have the last statement is what I'm saying, because they got the last opening statement. So uh, sorry with one of them too. I think that the advantage though, generally, like, I, I mean, and if there's even like empirical data on psychology, like the very first thing and the very last thing are the most memorable. So like, I think the advantage is usually like, the very first five minute or whatever, however long statement, and then the very last whatever. Statement. whatever. I, so I feel I, like Caleb should end it because yeah, like, of course, of course, that you would feel like that. Well, no, because I, I stepped all over statement. him in the in the th in the three minute thing. But, but you guys uh, did get the first statement of the debate. He should one of us should get the last statement of the debate, and um, I, I would say that should be Caleb, not me, because I stepped all over Caleb earlier. Let let Caleb do it. He's just gonna repeat commenter and stuff from the 30s like it's not like it be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> okay so we'll go over to um it, what we might as well i think keep the order then that we were going so if, if we want to start with mike then go over to brenton then eric and then caleb and these will just be the last statements before q a so who, who's going mike. so we'll start with mike and this is as long or as short as you'd like it to be but as long as it's not over five minutes all right. Yeah. I mean, I think we've heard a lot of, of stuff, a lot of accusations uh, hurled at Stryker and I, a lot of characterizations that we don't necessarily support, of course, in this format. Sometimes maybe you guys don't know or you don't understand some of the more nuanced points of what we talk about, um, you know, accusing us of being fans of the British Empire. I <laughs> That to me is just ridiculous. Yeah. Listen um, to Stryker and Mike sometime. Yeah. I mean, just actually listen to our show. You might be surprised uh, at the kinds of things that we talk about. I, I You know, the idea that um, perhaps some people are critical. There might be some intellectuals like critical of the Soviet Union or something, but generally speaking, you know, is it is it against the law to uh, to have said that, you know, Germany should have been crushed? No, but it is against the law to in any way attempt to rehabilitate Germany in, in Europe. I mean, that that's the facts. And in America, it's effectively it's not against the law. Like you won't go to jail, but you might lose your career. You might lose uh, your social standing, etc. And that that is another form of social control. And you're never going to lose any of that for supporting, frankly, any of the positions that you guys support. Uh, similarly, you know, you could talk this gender stuff. I did, I, it's absurd. Like, there's, there's no even point in responding to it. Like, that is stuff that that is not stuff that has anything to do with any kind of worker struggle. I mean, even if you're talking about a work or work, this is just just like crap that is thrown in there to confuse people and alienate them. It's it's not it, it's not relevant to anything. Like I said, with, with the racial stuff, obviously white is a category because uh, people are classed as such. So you, you talk about ra racialization or non-racialization. Let's say I even buy into your idea that um, that there's no genetic basis. I mean, I don't like arguing genetic stuff because it can get extremely it can get extremely detailed. And a lot of times people don't know what the hell they're talking about. So I don't pretend to. What I know is I'm white and other people that look like me are white and we are denied political rights based on this uh, classification. Others that don't have this classification are granted them. So I have an interest in uh, organizing with people of my same race to fight for that. That's it. I mean, you can you can just continue to try and, and back up that disenfranchisement by telling fables of, of people that did this before and did bad things. But that's that's really it's not convincing to somebody who today right now is denied uh, the right to advocacy and advancement because of their race. And the fact is, like, well, class this is kind also of a social idea. construct. Right, right. Well, let's, class let's, is let's, a social okay, construct. Yeah, You're yeah, going to get to go. You are going to get to go. Yes. Yeah. So this this is the point. Like dealing in all of a sudden something being a social construct only when it comes to race does this argument even come in. And I'm supposed to, like, respect some science which I feel is deliberately constructed to disenfranchise me and i i don't i'm not i'm not going to accept that why why is it in my interest like i said you know you can talk about uh the, these things science and throw papers around but this is not this is not working class there's nothing in this that is fighting for workers or for their rights or anything like that this is this is just uh, uh some kind of intellectual superstructure that is meant to confuse people and of course you know the idea that this is not this is not possible 
is is ridiculous. So we are here saying white men and, and people know that they're white. The government takes a census that asks you what your race is. As you can say, oh, the government is exactly the one that's creating this. But everyone has always believed in this. So if they're if they're divvying out rights and privileges based on this, then it's in my interest to understand that and to act upon it. Like I'm still white when I apply to college. I'm still white when I apply to a job and I'm still going to be the last on the, on the heap of the applications because of that. So it doesn't matter that you, you have some scientific arguments to you. you don't say that to black Panthers. Go and tell that to them. You won't because you class them as, as oppressed, which again, there you go. That's another exact part of the same intellectual superstructure I'm talking about. So there's that. Now, when it comes to I didn't hear anybody debating, you know, what I'm interested in, which is like, let's you know, I talked about the programs that were actually enacted in National Socialist Germany between 1933 and 1938, which I don't think anybody on this call would disagree with any of that. That is that rehabilitated that nation. Now, you could say, oh, it was based on race. Germany was a German country. Why shouldn't the government of Germany protect and support the rights of Germans. I mean, you're not going to get rid of all political borders. This is an absurd idea that, and it's only meant, it's only brought up, like China is China, right? People in China are Chinese. Sure, there's like 8% minority populations of this or that, but they're not letting white people to the top of their Politburo. They're not, you know, they're not doing that. And, and they would, they would not, this would not be something that they would even consider. So, only in Western white countries are these type of arguments brought forth to prevent the white population of these countries from political self-organization and self-actualization. And this is the point you talk about immigrants. Well, one of the biggest ways the capitalists uh, oppress workers is through the destruction of wages by the importation of immigrants who then become sort of a de facto slave class because they don't. Left. They, okay, because they don't have the same kind of rights, and so this is an this is a, this is an attack on on workers, immigra immigration itself. And it you know if you if you like democracy, if you have an idea that the people should get what they want out of the state, then you have to understand white Americans have for years wanted a number of things that they have never gotten, and one of those is immigration control. Other things are things like supporting strong families. And these are these are things that are mocked and ridiculed, not just by the liberal establishment, but by people like you. All right. This is a good point to close. I'll give you guys. Sorry, I, I let Mike go over a little extra just because sorry. I sorry. I, uh, I I didn't give you a warning in terms of like what I'll do for you guys is if you want to just peek at me in the Zoom window, I'll put up a finger to let you know if you've got two minutes left, one minute left. And uh, next up, Brenton, the floor is all yours. Absolutely. Uh, so to begin, Germany was German. That is begging the question. The nation state that was Germany was literally created by warfare, as is every nation state that has ever existed. These political divisions that seem to be really, really important, political, cultural divisions, these are only creations of the past few hundred years, maybe a few thousand. You said that race, uh, you know, you're, you look in the mirror, you see yourself as white. Yeah, so do I. But guess what? Back during Rome, there wasn't white and black. Like there were people who were white and people who were black, but there were only two races to the Romans. There were Romans and barbarians. And that's it. Because again, what can happen is people can have social constructs and subjective things can seem very, very real and very solid. And you have to actually take the time to delve into the philosophy and see beyond what is obvious. Because uh, again, it, it's this, the whole thing like with Plato's cave, where the person sits in the cave and just sees the, um, the shadows moving on the wall, and then a guy escapes, goes out and sees the real world, comes back and tells everyone about the real world, they will react exactly like you. No, I know what the real world is. It's these shadows on the wall. Shut up, you weirdo. So that's the first part. But you know what? Here's the thing. I've been pretty aggressive during this debate, uh, and, I, and I've done it because, for a number of reasons, um, particularly because there were a number of lies. Um, but he, here's the deal. I do want to uh, identify with you a little bit because I, I do believe you when you say you want to organize for your interests. And the thing is, you can do that. Again, we had Occupy Wall Street. That was exactly what Caleb and I was doing, and it didn't have a racial component to it. The fact is, is that when you bring in the racial component, when you try to organize around that fiction, what happens is you all, first you alienate a huge number of people. And then second, what happens is, is that because race is not a real thing, it, it, it falls prey to this vicious circle 
where fewer and fewer people are actually considered part of whatever race that you're going to do. And this happens everywhere around the country uh, and, and around the world. And it has happened every time people have tried to organize around these uh, principles in human history. The thing is, is that if you want to organize, what you need to do is you need to reach out to people on the basis of their humanity. You need to come from a place of compassion and you need to not get sidetracked by all this other stuff. Like, for instance, you, you said that you feel like you have less of a chance of getting into a university because there's some affirmative action. The thing is, that's not even statistically sound. What's happening is, say there's 100 positions in a university that could go to anyone. And before segregation, those a lot of those 100 positions all went to white people. I'm sorry, not segregation, um, uh, before affirmative action. Then they said, okay, we're having a problem because everybody is just giving these positions to white people. Let's make sure that 30, 30 of these 70, they can go to people of minorities. You are still competing against 70 white people. Those, you, you haven't lost any of those, uh, th any of those things. 10% are white Gentiles, by the it, way, do, at it, Ivy uh, League schools. It doesn't 10 matter. 10 white Gentile men. Hey, 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 okay, let me get, we, let me have my so then we would only have what, like two, three percent Jews, We do right? have to, we do have to, it's this closing statement. Yeah. So I said at the beginning of this, that there were going to be a lot of bad faith arguments and that there were going to be a lot of lies because again, fascism is internally incoherent. It is a feeling. Um, and you know what? I, it's fine. I'm one of the more emotional people out there. It's okay to have feelings, but you can't let those feelings lead you to get into a position where you are ignoring material facts of reality. And you also can't let that mislead you into a, into a point where you're hating on other people in your society to the point where so you're, you've got a guy on your show who's talking about unironic exterminationism. This is evil. In, in, the, in the truest sense of the word. Is that one minute? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is evil in, in the truest sense of the world. This is the barbarism that Daisaku Ikeda was talking about. Now, what I can say if, in, from my experience, both with Occupy Wall Street and with uh, my Buddhist organization, Soka Gakkai, where white people are actually a minority in this organization, uh, because it is a Japanese Buddhist organization. Um, the thing is, we had 50,000 youth uh, linked up across the country of all different colors, genders, ethnicities, whatever. And we were all united together. The, these, these enemies that you are looking at, they're shadows. And you've got to see past that to the actual reality. And when you do, and I guarantee you, when you come from a place of compassion, and when you do actually do the scary thing and reach out to the weird people who talk funny, you're going to find that you've got more in common than you probably thought. And you're going to find that your life is going to improve because you are no longer coming from a place of fear. Time. Thank you. Next, we'll switch over to Eric. So, Eric, the floor is all yours. So, I, I, I you know, I... I don't even like care if it's a feeling because we are romantics and we are idealists. That's why we hate Marxism. So we don't believe Please human define beings idealism. Are... Philosophical idealism. Ide... Okay. I, let me get to my point. The point is that you can talk. I did in the, in the Marxist context, for example, you could say that racism is a form of idealism, right? That's how a Marxist would see racism. It's not actually not a, what a, idealism is. OK, but I'm talking from a Marxist perspective. But here's the thing. That's not you from can, a Marxist perspective. Wait, well, does, Marxist are, believes that a Marxist sure believes that racism, a Marxist believes that race, race is an idea. And so discriminating against people is a for, uh, based on race is a form of idealism. That's what Mark contributed. I'm sure possibly Caleb, if he's going to be honest, would agree with me that that racism itself is not a product of class. Uh, of class development or the means of production. It's an idea that you guys say is to divide the working class, but it's whatever that I don't agree. So what I would say is this, you guys say race, gender, all these things. Well, class we know is a social construct, but race and gender, according to you, is a, is a social construct. Fine, fine. If you think that, fine. The thing is, you guys on the Judeo left don't actually mind identitarian organizing based on gender or on even even people even a man who wants to fuck another man up the ass 
has a right to a collective political identity, according to you. That is somehow a class that has a right to a political collective identity to advocate because for the cops were kicking their ass all, for doing that. All were, was, and you know closing. what? The cops, you can find a picture of me fighting with the yeah, cops. We've, we've, we've had the cops come the after face. us. I had, I was personally, you know, you know, what's funny, Brenton, you know what mm -hmm. you, I, I can tell that you're possibly a, a person who believes this stuff. And that's, you know, I respect pe sincere people of any political stripe. Thank okay. you. I do. But here's the thing. When I went out to protest, I was surrounded by cops and leftist scum and they attacked me together. OK, yep. that was my experience and experience of a thousand five hundred people. Really? Because I, I have a friend who was attacked at that exact same event by Identity Europa and the cops One stood second. aside. They're and lying. Well, well, they're lying. They're lying. I know lying. Identity I Europa okay, and they don't fight. Gotta... People. So anyway, Bullshit. the idea that okay. Identity Europa fights people is ridiculous. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a laughable <laughs> thing. We know. Trust me, we know. But anyway, the point is that if you guys even, you know, I'd love to see you or Caleb take your race is only a social construct to a black identitarian group. I'd love to see you do that. You know what would happen to you? And you know this full well is that you would be lynched by your comrades for it. So why is it that it's you, funny only, I have tell, done you right. only tell white workers and white people that are disenfranchised in this country that their identity is a social construct and thus illegitimate as a foundation for political organizing. How is it any more illegitimate than organizing based on your class, which is a social construct? All of these, we, in our worldview, we are oppressed because of our race, and this is actually brought about by many different policies. We get into them, but we don't have time. The point I'm making is that, like, you know, even if, I don't, I don't want to get into a debate about Apple groups and stall science and all that stuff. Race is, to an extent, uh, uh, it, it is a combination of, of genetics, of science, and soul, okay? There, it's both. It's both things. And the, the thing I'm getting at here <clears throat> is that whatever, whatever your, 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 your assertion is, that it's not real, is irrelevant. Because you say gender isn't real, and you would support feminism, I assume, right? You support feminism, yeah? Well, I, am I not uh, muted? Uh, I support feminism in the sense that it is a critique of patriarchy and I am an right. anarchist. So okay. I support the critique of any kind of illegitimate you, hierarchy. Right. One so minute you, left. But, but you also believe that gender is a social construct. So you do believe that yeah. political organizing based on a social, social constructs are still important. And right. the thing Thank is, you. is that, yeah. There we go. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. From okay. You. Okay. So, Look, so dude, if you want to have a real conversation about this sometime, like we can have a real conversation, but it has to be in good faith. I'm you know? totally willing to do that. I, yeah. The thing so, is, the, the bad faith is 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 not really coming so much from you to an well, somewhat. But the bad faith is like you know, uh, before I have to go, uh, it's is Caleb like his his like ridiculous like dinosaur Soviet definition of fascism, which is a load of horse shit where the Soviets would call the Social Democratic Party of Weimar Germany fascists. And then he, he goes around calling uh, 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 Pinochet, a neoliberal, calls him a fascist. I mean, this is... Uh, pretty you know, much a fascist we are anti-Pinochet. love their helicopter. And we're running we out are, of time. Are, yes, those are, those are libertarians, that, like these rabid libertarians. We're going to we don't do. switch it over to Caleb for the final closing. Then we'll go into Q&A. So thanks so much, Caleb. The floor is all yours. I must say, you know, I'm one of the few leftists that will do these kind of debates. And I will say this has got to be the worst debate I have ever had. Um, this is a complete <laughs> clusterfuck. And I almost feel like this was a complete waste of my time. This is not an encouragement for me to ever have a debate like this again. I probably will. But tonight, you know, I don't feel like anything really productive was discussed. Um, you know, August Babel, he very famously said that anti-Semitism is socialism for fools. Right. Some people. What about anti-whiteism? I'm sorry. May I finish? Anti-whiteism. Hold on. We right. got to let him finish his statement. That, you know that that. No, you know, won't. Some people are Eric. not capable of understanding capitalism and economics and class struggle, and they think purely in racial terms. I'm in this group, and we're being treated unfairly. There's this other group, and they got it better than my group. I mean, this is typical, right? And it's sad. It's one of the curses uh, of the working class. As people are struggling to survive, I've heard this in every from every community I've ever been part of, and uh, you know they think that their group suffers the most, and the other group doesn't suffer as much, and they wish the cops would go beat them up more and be nicer to them, and they wish they got paid more in the other race that has it too good. This is just this is just sad when people are fighting for crumbs 
This is what they're reduced to. And I also think it's kind of sad that so much of this debate has basically resolved, revolved around who's more persecuted, right? Are the, you know, the, the government's harder on me? No, the government's harder on me. I, I know Russian the Olympics. Harder on me, as if that's an argument for, for us being correct, right? I mean, and, and I, don't, I do think the government is harder on genuine leftists and anti-imperialists around the world. But, but the fact that that's even the terms on which we're debating is kind of sad. I mean, I, I mean is it not? Um, and I, I also want to add that, you know, earlier in the debate, it was said, quote, white males are fighting for representation in the United States. I mean, I'm sorry, but I mean, I mean, is it even worth talking to somebody who thinks that that's a, a, a legitimate statement that white males are not represented in the U.S. system? I mean, that's ridiculous. But white people are suffering in the United States right now. No question about it. There's a lot of low income white people that are suffering. There's a lot of white working class people, a lot of young working class people who are suffering. And to those folks, they need to look into American history because every time things have gotten better for white workers, it has been because they've been in alliance with black workers, whether that was in the, the 1930s when you know, they were fighting for union representation and, and social democracy and, and you know, benefits and social security and union representation and fascists <laughs> tried to overthrow Your the background government picture and attack hilarious. strike. I whether think that's, that's what that's Jim's doing right about now. The 1960s, the struggles that went on then. I mean, it has always been- Man, we're gonna go live and just call out Jim because would be upheld. I think he's I mean, a no-show, but he's honestly, he is known as really Really unreliable. Why would you support a, a, an institution? I think he's got set like white workers off to die. I, don't know. I to think he gets what's that word? Cold feet really Empire, soon before a debate and cotton, just like decides right? to just you know, not show the, up or the, something. The way white workers have gained is by supporting black workers, right? It's black and white unite and fight has always been the basis of advancing, Praise. advancing Praise. white workers. Segregation, racism has always been bad for white workers. Yeah, yeah. crazy. Yeah. No question about it. Oh, yeah, it's been, you know what, tomorrow night's going to be great because I've right? confirmed it was, it was with mentioned both immigration. You know, there and is a problem geologist. with mass migration and the but immigrants this, like, are the first to tell you that. This will be the last time I try and they, set up they, a debate They're coming here because we I'll have a global system of capitalism that's driving wages down all over the world. Unorganized. And, and let me add, though, that when I, I hear all, all right place. people talk, they don't have a real solution. Well, we'll you um, the did you send it to John? MS-13 ever had. Making immigrant communities afraid to call the police. Send it uh, to making, John. I, I mean, emailed Mark Drysdale and Steve was right, but I don't know if they're going to respond in time. But we'll go live for a few uh, minutes and just, the, the we'll just, if, if Jim doesn't show up. And as a result, they were not getting tested for coronavirus. You guys don't really want to solve problems. You just want to get a cathartic event. You're all about punishment. You're all about repression. It satisfies this desire you have, your pent up rage. But you don't really want to solve problems. You, you. You enjoy some kind of cathartic, uh, you know, you read Mussolini's writings. He's all about this, right? It's not about actually solving problems. It's not about actually improving things. A lot of people are suffering, but racial separatism is not going to get us out of the crisis we're in in the United States right now. I mean, if you look at it, why are so many people in the United States locked up? Why do we have mass incarceration? Because of racism, demonizing African-Americans, arguing, you know, the scare, the black community, gangs. Yeah. You still cross the street why when you see a group of blacks. Why are our civil liberties so. being taken away in the United States right now? Because guys like you say the police are always right. He deserved it. He deserved to get huh. killed. Police we brutality don't say is that. made up to oppress white say that. Cops. Hey, hey let him finish his thing. Kind of and And racism is hurting everyone the reason our rights are being taken away the reason our jobs are being taken away is because of this ideology because there is no class solidarity black and white unite and fight you know that's how we've always gained everything in this country and that's one the second. only way we're going to get out of this mess one sec we uh i'm going to give uh just because i think the last two minutes or so i for some reason we had some sort of malfunction where our producer praise somehow started talking into the stream yeah, so, that was messed up. <laughs> um, what the heck, praise? Uh, let me uh, figure out what's going on with that. Uh, but we'll give you a two minutes, Caleb. I'm honestly so sorry about this. I promise his punishment will be swift and severe. But uh, we can give you two minutes if you had anything extra. When was I interrupted? What was I? It was just I... the last two minutes or so where not even two minutes it wasn't for two minutes it was like no it was a very brief seconds. moment yeah you got, you got, moment. You, you, you got a little interrupted um, i will just reiterate my point 
that if we are going to get out of this crisis and if people are going to improve things, the idea that we're going to set up some kind of white man's Israel in the middle of middle America, forcibly deport all the minorities, set up some kind of police state there and make sure none of them are hiding and, and start trying to glorify Hitler. Let me add this, you know what I mean? You know, the term neo-Nazi, right? I mean, I, I'm a socialist, communist, whatever. I'm not a neo-communist. I'm not a neo-socialist. I'm not a, you know, I mean, you know, why is it neo-Nazi, right? One can right we didn't invent that right term. <laughs> That's a, a term of abuse. That's a term you guys invented. Glorifying Hitler in the uh, year 2020 is mental illness. It's it's really mental illness. I don't okay, know what's Mr. going Stalinist. on. Okay, Mr. Stalinist. But if you think yeah, that I mean, yeah, I mean, well, Caleb's not a Stalinist. Let's, let's, let's let Caleb the finish, right? and then I promise I mean, we'll go into Q&A. I thought really we could be objective. I thought we could be objective about history, right? No, no, no. Now we're mentally ill. We're trying to be objective. Let's let listen Caleb to the finish. science, Mike. Okay, the science I, of Marxism. I mean, I mean, I mean, you look at the the alt right guys and their silly costumes and all of that. I mean, you guys need some help. I feel sorry for you, and I really hope we've got to go into Q and A. Can I can I jump in really quick? I, I, I'm sorry, Brenton. Just to just to, okay, just to keep it fair, I got to say no. Uh, we got to go into Q and A. Okay, thanks for. I, I was going to be nice to those two, but okay. <laughs> okay, well, I um, 